好了，那我们看第三段，在这一节啊，哈特森教授的这个第三段这一节里边呢，他就谈论了经济衣服与低度发展在两次大战后的世界的形成。他认为呢，当今世界的新兴战争是经济战，经济战的一部分是思想战和意识形态战，这正好承接了他刚才第二段所说的内容。就他在第二段里边讲到了西方经济思想的时候，把它直接归结为是政治宣传，特别是西方经济学教科书，尤其是新自由主义经济学的教科书，他认为这就是意识形态。那为什么中国会把学生送到美国学习经济学，而他们管理自己经济的方式与教科书所教的完全相反？每一个成功的经济体都是公司混合经济体，也是最重要的部门要掌握在公众手中。那也就是说。中国现在的大型基础设施啊，这个军种工业体系，嗯，还基本上属于这个国有大企业为主啊，来掌握着，那就是服务于全社会发展的、服务于综合性的、可持续发展的这些公共部门，仍然还在国有手里。这当然就包括着各种公用事业啊、银行和信贷体系啊、工业工程体系。那金融体系的作用，是为了配置资源以保持经济增长。那金融工程的目的不是生产更多的商品和服务，这个和工业的体系相对立的金融工程，它是要抬高资产价格来寻租来实力的。And in World War One, as we'll dis- be discussing in the next few lectures,、uh, the world stopped taking the socialist、uh, line of development、uh, that was pioneered by Germany and the United States.、Uh, the United States emerged as a creditor nation.、Uh, Europe was broke, and、uh, the United States、uh, insisted in being paid for all of the arms that it had sold to the European allies before they entered the war.、Uh, Europe went bankrupt, and the United States, to make a long story short, absorbed almost all of the world's gold by、uh, the end of World War II.、Uh, and、uh, the result is that the United States used its financial wealth to、uh, create an entire different economy, an entirely different kind of ethic. It no longer fo-、uh, supported socialism. In fact. As soon as the Russian Revolution occurred in 1917,、uh, the United States and Britain sent troops over to try to fight、uh, to overthrow、uh, the Russian government.、Uh, the uh, uh, the whole idea was called pulling up the ladder. We in the United States, England, and Europe are、uh, are rich by having a strong government. Let's prevent any other country from getting rich the way we did. Let's prevent any other country from having a government. Strong enough to limit a、uh, financial class because we are going to be the financial class. We're going to be a global financial class, and finance capitalism is a、uh, a, a global movement. Now, the the,、uh, the result is, or instead of、uh, being a protectionist, once、uh, America became the industrial producer of the world, insisted on free trade. This is just what England did in the early 19th century. Uh, England had gotten rich through a policy called mercantilism, protecting its own industry, subsidizing its industry, and preventing the col- its colonies from developing any industry in its own. The objective of industrial England was to make its colonies and other countries dependent on it. Likewise, in the United States, it got rich by、uh, protective tariffs, by government、uh, subsidy of infrastructure. It then said, "Okay, now、uh, we are the leading industrial producer. We want other countries to be dependent on us." So it began to teach a theory that told other countries, "Don't protect yourself. That's socialist. Don't、uh, have the government develop industry. Don't do anything at all. Just follow your comparative advantage. Your advantage is in being poor. Use it as an advantage. Use your poverty to make low-priced labor. You can make paper flowers and." Uh, sew up baseballs and leave everything, all the capital investment to us, and、uh, that's what、uh, has been taught in textbooks since、uh, basically、uh, since World War War、uh, One. And the idea is that、uh, America, England, and other industrial countries would export high profit manufactures to countries that agreed to specialize in agriculture and raw materials production, 
and low-wage handicrafts. And that was called free trade imperialism. Free trade is a way of making other countries dependent on you if they're naive enough to believe what's in the textbook and they don't try to get rich by having their own government. And if they don't follow what now is called uh, socialism, World War II was ending. In 1944, the United States created the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And the World Bank uh, told uh, agri other countries, Latin America, Africa, and Asia, well, uh, we, we'll make loans for you to develop, but you cannot uh, develop by competing with anything that America produces. You cannot grow your own food. You should grow plantation export crops. Don't have land reform because land reform people, you know, once you have land reform, you have socialism and the government and you're independent. Uh, you, know, you want plantations. Uh, uh, you want to buy all your food in the United States and don't create any manufacturers that can compete with this. So the World Bank would make loans for, uh, for roads to export uh, raw materials, to export food, uh, uh, ports. They wouldn't make loans to develop the domestic economy. And the international, and obviously countries following this very quickly ran into a trade deficit. That was the whole idea. America and the industrial nations want other countries to run a deficit with them. That's how they get rich, by running a surplus with other countries. And uh, countries would have to then begin to borrow money from the International Monetary Fund to finance the deficit. Otherwise, their currency would go down and they'd get poorer and poorer. So the International Monetary Fund said, OK, we'll lend you the money, uh, but you have to follow certain rules. You have to prevent unionization. Uh, you don't want labor unions. You have to lower the price of labor. Yeah, you have to dismantle government. Uh, you have to balance your budget by selling off your electric utilities, your roads, your ports to private uh, uh, private investors, mainly American investors, British investors, and European investors. And so all of a sudden, you had what seemed to be an international economy pretending to make the whole world rich, actually making the whole world poor and poor. So uh, adopting free trade and failing to control foreign capital movements actually underdeveloped economies. A new word had to be introduced to the language. You underdevelop an economy by making it dependent instead of actually uh, developing it. Uh, and so the theory of how to economic growth became just as warped uh, as it is today as the United States is uh, deindustrializing. And the ideal American economic diplomacy was to make other countries dependent on the United States farm exports so that uh, if a country does something the United States didn't want, like China did something that America really didn't like in the 1940s and 50s. It had a revolution under Mao. So what did America do? It said, we'll starve them all. We'll show that the only way China can succeed economically uh, is to uh, re uh, get rid of the communists. And so we're going to have an embargo. We're going to tell countries, don't sell any grain to China make it starve. And America passed the grain embargo to try to starve China. Canada uh, said, wait a minute, our farmers make money. If, we, uh, if we're producing all this uh, grain, if we don't sell it to China uh, and uh, countries that are like it, then all of a sudden our prices will go down and all of our farmers are going to go bankrupt. So they broke the embargo. They sold their grain to China. And that's how China was able to survive under Mao. But what this showed Mao was that the United States wanted to make China as dependent on the United States as possible. Just like today, when uh, President Trump is saying, we're going to have an embargo information technology on chips, on high technology uh, to China, uh, we'll try to disrupt its industry. The United States strategy is to be in a position where it can disrupt the uh, economies. Uh, and the industrial production of China or any other country that doesn't agree to sell off its economy to American investors to make uh, American banks uh, come in and uh, end up uh, getting all the benefit of uh, higher uh, Chinese housing prices. Uh, a lot of Americans buy out your companies as Trump is insisting that TikTok uh, sell its, uh, its company to America free, just as if you're going to have to grab it. And then uh, you were going to pay you something for it, but then we're going to tax what you get. Uh, it's simply an asset grab. Uh, the new kind of warfare in today's world is economic warfare. It's not monetary warfare. It's economic warfare. 
Uh, and uh, part of the economic warfare is intellectual and ideological warfare. And that's what Chinese are taught when uh, they're sent uh, to the United States to study. I don't understand why China would send its students to the United States to study economics when uh, the way that China is managing its own economy uh, is the opposite of everything that uh, is taught uh, in the textbooks because as I said, <clears throat> every uh, successful economy is a mixed public-private economy. Uh, and the most important sectors to keep in public hands are public utilities, banking and credit. China does this. In the United States now, there are a lot of bankruptcies of companies. When a company is bankrupt, uh, the, the banker and uh, the bondholders take over and they sell to the uh, highest bidder at a fraction of the actual price. Just as when they foreclose on a house, uh, they'll sell the house at an auction at a low price. Now, many Chinese companies also are not able to pay uh, uh, the money that they've uh, borrowed from the Bank of China. But the Bank of China is very different from a private banker in the United States. The Bank of China says, okay, uh, we understand that you can't pay uh, the debt that you're scheduled to pay. What are we going to do? We're not going to shut you down. We're not going to make you fire your workforce. We want to keep you in business because you're our means of production. So we're just going to write down the debt to what you can pay. Uh, we're going to provide you with enough credit that you can uh, create your factory, you can buy your raw materials, uh, but we want to, uh, when uh, you can't uh, make a profit uh, and pay uh, the interest and the debt that we've given you, we're not going to shut you down because otherwise we're going to have mass unemployment like the United States. Uh, China runs its financial system uh, to allocate resources to keep its economy growing. And the, the reality is that in every financialized economy, uh, it's centrally planned. America is more centrally planned than the Soviet Union was. America is the most centrally planned economy in the world, but it's planned by Wall Street. It's planned by the financial sector. It's planned by the bondholders. And the fact is they're awful planners. Their planning is what's bankrupted the, company, the country. Their form of planning is what is deindustrializing the United States. Uh, China's planning does not bankrupt the country. China's planning, uh, it, uh, still, it's the Bank of China, it's the government that decides who's going to get the credit to build what factories where, to build houses, to, uh, to house the Chinese, to build roads, uh, to build uh, the communication system and the uh, infrastructure and the uh, telephone system. Uh, but it, it's aim, industrial engineering, not financial engineering. Somehow in the United States, the fact that finance and credit and money is the central planning thing has led the United States to uh, abandon industrial engineering and to do financial engineering, whose objective is not to produce more goods and services. It's simply, as I said, to increase stock prices, to increase housing prices, to, and all of this is increased by debt. You, you borrow more money, to buy a house. And people will say, I'm getting rich, the house is worth more, but it's getting worth more because you're borrowing more and more money to the bank and you have to pay more and more interest charges on your mortgage. And uh, while you think you're getting rich, you're actually getting more and more in debt. But strange as it may seem, debt is not included in the economics models. It's not included in the curriculum. Uh, the, just like uh, the uh, GDP statistics don't include uh, uh, they count disease as increasing GDP. They count the increase in crime as increasing GDP because you need more gates on the windows, you need more policemen, you need more protection. All that increases GDP. When you get sick, that increases it. You know, hospital uh, expenses go up, you need more doctor's payments, you need more drugs. Uh, the more a drug company can charge for drugs, the more GDP goes up. Uh, people can't believe that this is actually how they make the statistics. But the joke used to be uh, in, uh, in New York and in Germany, you don't want to see how a sausage is made. You may like eating frankfurters and uh, sausages. You don't want to go to the store and see how it's made because then you're not going to want to eat it anymore. Well, you can say the same thing about GDP statistics. Uh, you don't want to see how they're made because you think, wait a minute, that's uh, 
uh, sort of goofy that they don't know the difference between a cost and overhead, uh, between wealth and overhead. And uh, what they think is wealth is actually the ability to charge the rest of the economy more and more and more. So instead of making the United States more productive, this financialization has uh, deindustrialized it and made it a post-industrial economy. Well, already 50 years ago, uh, 40 years ago, all sorts of books are being written, the post-industrial economy, why it's going to be good for you. Nobody will have to work. We can all live on uh, by saving money and putting it in the stock market and uh, live off the rising value of our houses. Well, how can the price of a house rise unless new buyers don't have to borrow more and money, more and more money to buy it? This was a, it was a kind of silly uh, kind of reasoning. But uh, again, if you look at uh, the list of the uh, richest uh, men in the United States, uh, Forbes magazine has the richest 500 Americans, the richest 500 Europeans. I think it has a list of the 100 rich, richest Chinese. Uh, the way to make money is not by industrialization in these countries. It's really by getting something from the public domain. And novelists understand this more than uh, uh, economists. Uh, Balzac, the French novelist, said that behind every family fortune is a great theft. Usually it's forgotten about. You know, people don't really know, how did they get this land that made them so rich? How did the members of Britain's House of Lords get all the money to give them all this real estate? Well, long ago, uh, uh, 800 years ago, their ancestors were warlords. They got in a warlord band, they conquered England, and they gave all the land to themselves on a hereditary basis. Uh, that was a theft. Uh, in the United States, uh, the, in the 19th century, the railroad barons uh, essentially uh, uh, bribed politicians to give them uh, land around the railroads. They became the richest uh, people. Almost uh, every country uh, has uh, rich people getting, privatizing something from the public domain, whether it's uh, national forests or water rights or land rights uh, that you see from the uh, Native Americans. Uh, uh, basically, uh, it's a free lunch. Now, when Milton Friedman came to China, I think 30 or 40 years ago, uh, and tried to uh, uh, tell him, here's uh, how Americans got rich. Uh, it really wasn't Ameri how Americans got rich, but uh, he, he told them, uh, he got famous for his slogan, there is no such thing as a free lunch. The reality is, economics is all about how to get a free lunch. You get rich by exploiting somebody by getting something for nothing. Uh, you can grab the, you can take their land, push them off it, and then you can charge them rent for it. That's how the Romans got rich in antiquity. Uh, you can get rich by bribing the government to get, uh, build a road that goes right by pro land that you've owned, which is many Hollywood movies are made about how uh, Southern uh, mayors and governors got rich that way. Uh, uh, but you almost always get rich by somehow corrupting uh, government. So government corruption is the way to get rich. Uh, the, the Americans would say, well, there you are. The way for China to get rich is you want to corrupt enough government so you can have as many billionaires as Russia and America has. Uh, I hope that's not the way China goes. And they should have seen that this was what uh, Milton Friedman was trying to tell them uh, in the beginning. So, you know, we can see that in this third part, he's talking about two things. 他追求流动性获利那进一步看呢他认为我们现在都遵循GDP 
GDP 来源于金融为中心的服务业，香港是 85% 那因此呢，他们都是实体经济衰败，啊，实际社会两极分化也是越来越来越大的。因此呢，他说呢，金融财富实际上是对经济其他部门收取越来越高的费用，削弱他们的活力。尽管他借用了这个弗里德曼的一个一句话，叫“天下没有免费的午餐”。但他实际上对弗里德曼的这个自由主义经济学持批判态度的。他说呢，这种经济学恰恰是关于如何获得免费午餐的理论。那希望各位呢，对他这个讨论西方理论的这个矛盾，直接指出西方理论，特别是金融资本问世以来的西方经济学理论的所谓的不断的创新，尤其是拿金融资本理论来创新，以金融资本可以。获得独立的利润这样的这样的理论创新，来指导西方经济学理论的这个发展，我想他的这个批评呢是非常直白的，也是非常尖锐的。我们从这个角度，大家应该不论是怎么看，都应该是不过分的。所以我还是希望我们能够懂得这到底是怎么回事希望大家能够啊有有意识的去理解，那有意识的去做做比较，才能理解。我们到底应该如何看待西方的经济学理论？